Welcome everybody, PM Trask here with the White Lily Channel. We had some content sent to us last night that jumped ahead of about three other projects and some stuff I need to do in my personal life. But I must tell you, it was so good that I'm going to review it for you in front of those other things. Title is Jack Irons, The Steel Cowboy. Now, I rate this about 9 out of 10. But that's because I like this kind of content. Um, and I like this kind of art. Um, it's, it's not maybe my favorite kind of art. It might not even be my favorite kind of content, but I do like it. Um, and po possibly that speaks to the fact that I grew up in the late 70s and 80s. I was a teenager then. Um, and so it may not appeal to you. I, I suspect the people that produce this title are younger than myself, but they're hearkening back to those concepts. Jack Irons in many ways is a uh, story or a title that uses concepts and mashes them together. Um, and I'm going to tell you from my point of view, I don't know these people that produce it. I, if I describe them incorrectly, that's on me. The mashup is a very interesting combination of Road Warrior or Mad Max, a series I knew, which they may never have even known, called Ran Xerox in the late 70s which was a cyborg with a, anyway, very violent, very postmodern, stipulated a terrorist future. That's not what this book is about. But I see a lot of correlations between these titles and the form of the art. Also, the author brings in a very strong Native American um, influence. The author has a lot of ideas. They are well formed. You can tell he was thinking about it. And he says, you know, Something to the effect, I'll paraphrase, of this story, um, it makes my life worth living. When you produce something that's important to you artistically, you will know what he means. Uh, it's like birthing a child, and it gives, not in the, only in the moment of creation, but also when people come to you and they say, wow, that helps me resolve certain questions in my mind. The center of the storytelling that it looks like the stories all begin at, or at least are centered in is a cantina um, hearkening back to the cantina on Tatooine, which is Star Wars. Um, so Jack tends to have a central place at the bar that is known to be his. He pretty much talks to whatever drunk is sitting next to him and he is telling about his past and I'll summarize that Jack seems to have lived 250 lifetimes over the course of 2,000 years by his own reckoning and he seems to know all of them. He remembers them all. So that's interesting because I do study Buddhism and Hinduism, etc. And they say, you know, maybe the average human should live about 500 lifetimes before they figure it out and then they become a Buddha and they leave this realm and they join the pure energy realm. They rejoin the source. Even Christians think kind of in those terms. Jack is saying he's lived 250, and apparently this is his 251st, over about a 2,000 year span. And I find this very interesting, is that the world goes to hell, and we sell out to local evil influences, like demons that we offer ourselves to for salvation, and then there's a massive plague effectively, which is purposely created by humanity to fix our problems. Um, and then later on, to escape those demonic influences, the good humans who again rise up um, ally with aliens who then quarantine our planet and to keep the evil on, on our planet. And that's effectively the evil is encompassed into later what is called the Four Horsemen. The author is Cody Fernandez, and Cody does not put together a story and take his ideas like a mallet and smash over the head. He sprinkles them like salt and it's your job as the reader to discover those and figure out how those tie together. And, and I can sense and I can read in the, in the material when he really knows what he wants to say and says it well. And then in other places he's just trying to get through the building section and he kind of muddles it a bit. The art is done by Maximilian Dallot. Um, by the way, 
Cody Fernandez has a very strong Latino, um, I, I get a very strong Latino vibe out of him. Um, Maximiliano Dolo, that sounds Italian to me, but Clint Eastwood filmed much, many of his films in Italy, because he could do it cheaper, but also Italians are very creative and, and can take instruction well, and, and they can create your idea if you explain it correctly to them. So I wonder if Cody looked around for a few years and finally found a guy that could bring his concept to life. Um, Having said that, at the end of the second issue, I believe it is, there is a lot of fan art of Jack Irons. And they're interesting. And if you recall in an earlier video, we were talking about creativity, but you just have to put it together differently and then put your own style. This is a very good example of that, which tells you the story is touching a lot of people because it's really pretty good. Um, but of all those styles, Maximilian is clearly his favorite to tap to do his art. Jack says, I've lived all these lifetimes and I remember my first lifetime, he's a simple farmer. And I take the imagery to be um, ancient Babylon. He's farming with his mother and he says, the face of my mother is, gives me joy, you know, it gives me warmth. Bang, the mother's dead on the ground and there's this barbarian, well there's this warrior that's just crushing the peasants and killing them all, including the son, who he was. So Jack is saying, I was that young boy, I love my mom, saw her killed, and, and then got killed myself, murdered. Um, and um, I was innocent and righteous, and it didn't matter. Right off the bat, this is a different kind of storytelling than we are accustomed to. The good are often crushed under heel, under chariot wheels. Being right and being even brave often is not nearly enough. And so if those are your starting philosophical positions and you're not going to be fatalistic, although Jack is fatalistic, the character, but I mean negative fatalism, which is to say that everything is always going to end badly or no matter what I do, it won't succeed or no matter how true I am, my lover will leave me. You know, if it is not that kind of fatalism. It is rather a kind of fatalism that says, life is eternal, after all, I'm living many, many lifetimes, and, thus, and thusly, so are you. If that is true, and you stay consistent to your principles, then eventually evil screws up. You know, the FBI says when they're after a criminal, they say, they say, we can make a hundred mistakes. We can make a thousand mistakes hunting this guy, but he can only make one, and then we got him. So it's kind of, I think the story kind of talks about that. It says, you know, evil rises up and it's powerful and it's sexy, you know, it's, you want to follow it because it offers you what you want in the short term. But ultimately it, it must fade because evil by definition is destructive and ultimately self-destructive. So if you remain consistently positive, eventually you're going to win out. It may not be in this lifetime though, so if that's your standard, you might be disappointed. Um, by the way, Jack lays down three principles that he believes in at the beginning of episode one. And they are these. I'm taking my glasses to read them. One. All things are endless. Two, tenacity gets you through to, to where you want to be. And three, there's no harm in being dramatic. In other words, if you're going to do something, you know, be kind of cool when you do it, right? Have a little flair in your life. Because at the end of the day, if you want people to appreciate you, you kind of want to entertain them while you're doing what you're doing. So I actually agree with these concepts. Um, all things are endless. I believe energy is neither created nor destroyed. It simply changes form. That means you. Um, tenacity gets you through. He says it differently, but effectively that means you're not dead and you don't fail until you decide you fail. And this means humanity is destined for the stars if we simply keep that in mind and have a little class and have a little panache while we're doing what we do, right? And I love how the author takes the chance and says, okay, if you believe that, then you must also believe that in the short term, things look pretty bad, almost always. 
here's Athens, Greece, and this is my lifetime in it. And my name was Lioness. Okay, I take that to be a bit of a um, play on words off Leonidas, um, which immediately as a reader, I'm thinking Lioness, Leonidas, is he thinking Spartan? Because he's saying it's Greece, I'm sorry, Athens, Athenian. Um, now, Athenians and Spartans, if you were an outsider to the Greek culture, you might confuse the two. Um, you should know, though, that they absolutely despised each other. They probably only allied once. Um, and then right after that alliance, they busted up, created their own leagues, who then went right at each other's throats again. Um, because they represented diametric opposites, philosophically. The, the persona that he, he was in his second lifetime is defending his sister and by proxy defending the weak. And he's saying an important point which is repeated in Western culture which is, you know, weak isn't bad. Just because you aren't physically strong and can drive a spear through someone's head doesn't make you useless. And in modern culture this is terribly important because we need scientists, um, we need philosophers, we need people that can work on assembly lines, we need people that can sell goldfish. You know, and, and just because they're not muscular doesn't give a muscular man or woman the permission to kill them whenever they feel like it. And, you know, maybe he's just trying to get through this story to get on to what he really wants to talk about, which is the postmodern apocalyptic world that the Iron Cowboy um, exists in and dominates, really, in his own maverick way. To further the Spartan imagery, later on the king shows up, and the king has a Spartan helmet on, as well as his, his Praetorian guards, if you will. Well, Praetorians are Roman, I know that, but you see what I'm saying. Uh, the mob is calling for the death of Jack's previous incarnation, and ultimately he is killed. The first reading, I had a real problem with this. And in second reading, after I read through both, epi both novels, and I went back, I'm like, okay, I get what he's saying here. He's saying that even an important life can end quickly, and even a righteous man can die without much obvious effect at the moment. And then we go right to the cantina, remember? We're going back to the cantina. And um, I will admit to you, he keeps referring to this group of people called the Glore. And I'm not entirely sure who the Glore are. Um, if I had to guess, the Glore are alien, a group of aliens that have come to this planet. They're kind of just like humans. They look different. They're kind of more lizard-like. They're trapped here on Earth along with the humans. I could be getting this completely wrong. I apologize. Sorry, Cody, if I'm screwing this up. But that's my impression. There are Glores, and a lot of them on Earth. There are humans, of which I think outnumber the Glores still, and still have authority on their own planet. There are Borgs, which are cyborgs, or me mechanics, mechanical creatures. There are demons, who have some sway over control of the human population, and I'm not clear on that, and it's fine, because quite honestly, humanity has devolved, and society has devolved into chaos. And so it's not appropriate to say who has control of chaos because obviously it's nobody. We do see in the cantina, just like the Star Wars cantina, <clears throat> a cohabitation intention, at least, on the part of various species. And just looking at this image, I see, I don't know, at least three or four species right there. And they all want to basically get drunk and get along and probably bang, right? Um, somebody, by the end of the night. He then flips very quickly into his next lifetime that he remembers, which was 1778 Northeastern Territory, and he's Native American. Now, this would make him Algonquin, Cherokee, no, not Cherokee, um, Iroquois, possibly Iroquois. And of course, there are many other tribes of the, what, seven great nations um, that were so powerful that they fought among themselves and had long-standing alliances over large territories, uh, which surpassed the power of the early colonial settlers. I would guess even at the time of the American Revolution, 
if the native tribes all magically allied with each other, they could probably still... Um, they couldn't eject the colonialists, but they would be able to do a lot more damage than they did historically. There's a young man, he's hunting. Uh, for some reason, the tribal chief is out there visiting him. Well, it's because he raised him. I don't believe this is his real father. We learn later that this young man was raised by a grizzly bear. Okay, I have some problems with this whole storyline here. Um, I understand what you're trying to say here. Having said that, grizzlies did not exist in that region. Um, grizzlies are a northwestern species. Um, that's not to say that brown bears and black bears aren't there, and they can still hurt you. And the grizzly said to the chief, raise him, he's special. We start to learn that Jack Irons is kind of, I'm going to go ahead and say, in my mind, he's kind of the story like Hercules. He's sort of a demigod. I'm re-watching the entire, the entire Star Trek original series, you know, Kirk is captain. And the more you watch it as an adult, because I watched it as a young, young person, you know, five-year-old maybe, and, and watching and re-watching. And to me, those were like historical documents, you know, these adult people doing adult things in space. And now as an adult, I watch it and I realize they're, they're actually indicating something over the, at least the first two seasons. That Kirk is kind of a demigod because in space he goes places and he says his name and his exact name, like this is Kirk beam me up, is the exact phonic sequence to open up something that an ancient civilization built. He also procreates with women across the galaxy and leaves children for later entire worlds will be led by his son who he leaves this one woman impregnated. Like that, I'm beginning to think that Jack Irons is kind of a demigod, just as Hercules was. And just likewise, Hercules didn't know he was the son of Zeus, and likewise Kirk didn't know. And I mean, it was never revealed to Kirk, but I wonder if there's a revelation coming here. It, it, maybe that ruined your, your intended storyline later, I don't know. But I, the other problem I have is that the the, the head warrior, which is the younger brother of the chief, wants to ally with a suave white guy, right? A suave colonialist who's offering arms, drink, food, technology, wagons. And the chief, the old chief is like, no, I forbid it. We will be, we will remain separate from those people. Oh, why is, the, why is this guy gonna offer all this stuff? Because he wants to buy land. And their argument is actually pretty valid, which is they probably are going to take it anyway. Why not just make the agreement since they're going to do it anyway? Oh, I, I just got it. I just got it, Corey. This is another Faustian deal. This is the point of the story that humans make Faustian bargains with the devil. At any rate, I wish you could have had the chief being the one that said, let's make the deal. And the warrior leader saying, Let's fight these bastards. I don't care if we're all killed. Because that fits our perceptions, right? But instead of the other way around. Now I understand that in, in history there are different people with different opinions and they could have very well been flip-flopped. But what's worse is the young man comes along who is an earlier version of Jack and says, no matter what we do, I don't want to die. My, I don't want to ever die. Jack was kind of a whimpering, I need to survive at all costs. I don't want to get an injury. I don't want my mom to yell at me, you know, while he's out hunting deer for the tribe. So he's clearly reached manhood, but he's a pretty pathetic man. You, you know, maybe this is a compare and contrast. So, and so basically Jack has to live another, what, 246 lifetimes, something like that? Get to the point that he is now, which is an ass-kicking warrior, and while he's fighting, he has a sense of humor, he has tremendous confidence, and he also is incredibly fatalistic about what humans have done, which is make a huge bargain with evil um, so they can feed 50% uh, of the population and the other 50% is killed. All right, we are back in the cantina and what's really cool and I love this is that Jack is obviously a hunted man. Um, he's committed numerous crimes and in a second here we'll see how many they really were. And the cyborg that's currently there to hunt him, which I kind of take as a bounty hunter, but maybe not, maybe he's simply acting in a police function on behalf of the faction that thinks they're in charge, which I guess are the gore. Um, I don't really know, I'm a little, I'm not sure about that part of the story, okay? 
but that's fine. I don't need to be sure. Um, so Jack says to him, you know, hey, thanks for letting me finish my conversation. That's very nice of you. And the cyborg then runs through his crimes, and here's the image, and oh my god, it's hilarious. Um, it's very well written. This part of the story is very tight because you know this is the part of the story that Corey really wants to tell. All the other stuff is preamble and prologue to letting you know the basic concepts and teaching the rules of his worldview. So now we're at that world that he really wants to talk about and everything works beautifully and seamlessly, although it's not simple. Um, and to me, this is the kind of story I like. Um, Jack dodges a laser beam and just like the heroes of old, he has a he has a separate conversation, like Batman and Robin would have conversations about, Robin, you really need to get back to high school while they're fighting the bad guys. Um, so Jack puts down the cyborg, long story short, does some damage, but even before the fight, he pays the proprietor of the bar for the damage that will occur in the fight. This is very Clint Eastwood, by the way, and I didn't mention it earlier, but I think that this whole storyline is heavily borrowing from a kind of a Clint Eastwood point of view. I think Jack Irons has a lot of Clint Eastwood in him. Um, and in fact, there's a quote later that I believe comes right from the movie Unforgiven. Um, I believe the quote is, uh, it's not an easy thing to kill a man, um, even for a non-man. You can consider that an homage to Clint, right? Um, who is amazing. He finishes the fight, and as he strolls out, he says, Damn Borg, didn't know anything. So the Borg ticked off all these hundreds of crimes, and he goes, he didn't even know half of them, right? So Jack is aware of his own criminality and his own divergence from, um, from, the, from the norm or the indicated proper behavior. And I would suggest that this is the confluence between heroes all do this heroes are all troublemakers they um you look at hercules you look at kirk you look at conan uh you look at jack irons you look at pretty much any clint eastwood character dirty harry particularly they're breaking rules and their bosses are always telling them that's not what i wanted you to do um and I think in the real world, we all know this is true, that there's the right way, there's the wrong way, and there's kind of the way we know we, it will work, but we pretty much try not to do it because we'll get in trouble. Well, that's why someone like Jack Irons is always on the move, always hunted, but always, always loved, I would guess you could say, is that he's strong enough and brave enough to take the barbs, if you will, take the barbs of society, not just the bosses, but also greater society, could ostracize you and isolate you and marginalize you for doing that which is effective, but not normal. And if you're gonna be artistic, if you've been artistic before and are trying to produce stuff, then you probably have some experience with this. Um, there's some really good fan art, really good. And I'll put a couple images up there. Um, that's episode one. I'm gonna go ahead and try to run through episode two much faster. Um, but again, I, I, I will say this. In episode two, the story really falls into the groove of what's it, what it wants to be saying. Essentially, the first book is, is an origin story. And two-thirds, if not 75% of it, is spent prepping you, building, building. And then it shows you a little action and then drops down in energy, which is perfect. If you saw the other review, that's exactly the formula. Up, 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 plateau, plateau, action, down. And end it on a lower note. You could do a teaser, but end it on a milder note to let the audience cool down a bit and then prepare their emotions and their energies for the next episode. And then they'll run out and they'll buy it from you. Um, at any rate, we're now in episode two. Again, I love the cover. The cover preps you for what you're gonna see. 
you know, the old the old story on speech making is tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Well, the cover sets you up perfectly, and it shows a destroyed. The first pan, the first good image of the story is a panel of a destroyed, presumably American city, because this is the American. Um, Southwest, or maybe the entire world is now a desert. I don't know, but I take it as an American story. Um, it's a destroyed city. I'm going to go ahead and guess it's. Uh, I'm going to say Denver. How's that? Uh, and it shows a kind of a medicine man, cowboy, future tech guy, with a dream catcher scepter, talking in some alien language, and it doesn't explain what it means. And you know what? That's pretty cool because it that's foreshadowing. Um, then it launches into, it's going to revise what it said in the first magazine, which is, remember? Remember Jack's three points? All things are endless. Tenacity gets you through and have a little style while you go. Well, the first page here is saying there's a zombie apocalypse. Um, what, what happened is, let me just bring you up on what happened. There was a food source that was um, discovered by this nerdy little scientist. And using any material compound, any group of minerals, even poisonous or radioactive, you could put in this machine that he creates, press a button, and edible food comes out ending starvation to humanity. So humanity can then move on and do more important things and not be a slave to you know, food. Well, even as he's announcing it and getting a Nobel Prize, bang, shot through the head. As we know, like for example, why don't we have combustion engines that get 200 miles per gallon, which is absolutely doable. Or God forbid, why do we use combustion engines at all when we could run them off fuel cells coming from water? Okay, we, we should all know at this point in history that is absolutely doable. Um, but we don't do it. Why? Well, because supply and demand of a rare commodity is far more marketable um, than unlimited supply. Once again, I'll go back to the Star Trek universe. What changes from us to that universe is one thing, and it's replicators, and then, and then ultimately uh, teleportation systems. You know, beam me up, Scotty. Well, so when they shoot the, the kid, that the young man that makes the comp, makes the machine that converts food, and it's called protein, protein, I believe, meaning protein, uh, protein, or maybe called prota. I've seen a couple different spellings in the magazine. Um, then they suppress the supply of this food. They suppress food. And they just make sure people get just enough to starve slowly, um, harkening back to maybe the Nazi treatment of un Undermunchens, right? Undermunchens were fed just enough to keep working, and they would die slowly. Well, then what happens is um, humans, the, the lower classes of humans, get sick of that. And they finally, finally find a leader who is dark, you know, evil, it's a demon, I presume, um, that says, I will, I will answer this question. I will defeat your oppressors and get you food. Um, and that will be one less thing you have to worry about. The signs that they hold up, like free protein now, well, then you see that later, as this is all in episode two, you see that later, FPN, that's their flag, free protein now. Um, and they rise up under a strong man, effectively, under the flag of FPN to oppose the elites, the oligarchs, those who are controlling them. Um, the oligarchs are then pushed into a Faustian bargain, again, returning to that theme, with some kind of evil figure, and I take this figure as being an alien. Now, I don't think all aliens are evil. I think... There's many percentage of evil aliens as percentage of evil humans. Um, although I think there are probably many more species. But at any rate, I'm talking about reality. But at any rate, 
the oligarchs effectively um, ally and put in charge this alien who promises them everything that people who are in charge want to hear, which is that I'll take care of all your problems. Um, I know what you need. I'm going to give it to you. And by the way, I'm the only one who can do that. So this is good. And in, in, if you're going to go for an interview and somebody says, are you the answer to my problems for my company? The answer is yes. Um, and you just smile and nod until they agree on a pay scale. Um, so they show this, this so-called, well, this sort of alien figure doing experiments on humans. Um, now I gotta tell you, this looks a lot like the Animatrix to me. Um, or it feels a lot like the Animatrix, where once the machines win the main war against the humans, they take a lot of human sample bodies, you know, men and women, and they test them, and they figure out how they tick. Well, what you realize later is how they tick is to figure out what disease can exactly kill half of humanity and the other half survives but becomes more human and less human all at once I guess um, you know I got it again doesn't this sound a lot like Avengers where you know the movie the recent ones you know the movies where Thanos his solution is to kill half um, I, I don't mind. I kind of wished he had picked like 90% in the magazine instead of saying 50%. Um, 90%, if you're going to kill half, go ahead and just kill 90%. I mean, to me, that seems more efficient. But not that I would propose doing this. For you mad scientists out there, do not make a disease to kill any percent, okay? That is not what this video is advocating. Before the series gets too dark, Jack, in his discussion, says, but then again, humans, the good humans, discovered their decency. They took down some of their oppressors, controllers, oligarchs, whatever you want to call it, leaders. They found each other, and they, they went and they pardon me, they went and they isolated themselves out in the desert, apparently, and they had babies. Um, he's having this discussion. He says, look, humans aren't perfect. There's still going to be pillaging and robbing and, and all that. And he also says the humans will have at least two factions, the good ones and the loonies. Also, you can call them cannibals. Um, and again, we go back to um, Mad Max, Mad Max um, Road Warrior. Uh, this series is very strongly evoking Mad Max. And, and we see in this part of the magazine, um, heavily borrowing from that theme. Um, so Jack says, I guess you wonder where I was at during this moment in history. And he admits, I was on the border between the two, be between uh, the controlled space and between the wild spaces where the humans have a hideout out in the middle of that. And he goes, basically, I was drunk, I was checking out, I was depressed, evoking Clint Eastwood's uh, westerns very, very much. On a pale horse, a few dollars more. All of these dealt with um, the idea of a hero who is so disappointed in his own society that he turns his back on it. And in his self-exile, he discovers something. Um, and by the way, isn't this the story that an aesthetic lifestyle, a self-denial, especially a time in the desert, walking for 40 years, does this sound familiar? Teaches you something and reveals something to you. And then you bring that back to society and that idea <clears throat> or that renewed um, information helps society survive in the future. Um, and I would propose that's what the little girl, Sarah, is to Jack Iron. Um, he, she is a discovery, a revelation, and a reminder of his own decency. And I'm going to go back and mention again that in my youth, there was a magazine called Ran Xerox. R-A-N-X, and then the Xerox, like, like the company Xerox. And he was a um, cyborg. He was a machine with, I think, a flesh exterior. And um, 
and he kicked ass. He kicked serious ass. And he pretty much messed up anybody who got in his way. And he had a little girlfriend, a human, who, Lubna, who he loved. It was the only thing in love he loved, I believe. And she was constantly fooling around with other guys. Um, and he, and she would deceive him. And he was, you know, he allowed himself to be deceived. And um, for its time, look, I'm going to tell you something about the 80s. You could pretty much say or do just about anything in the 80s because the goal was pleasure. Now, I was, I was um, 15 in 1980. But I remember the adults were out still at the disco, still banging like there was no tomorrow. Um, the gay guys had 500 to 1,000 lovers each. I'm, I'm not judging. I'm just saying these are facts. Um, and it was, you know, the Bee Gees were at the top. Um, you could tell by the way I use my walk, I'm a woman's man, no time to talk, right? There was a reason all of that was happening right then because pleasure was the goal. And there were no breaks on that system. And of course, we all know what happened in the 80s, right? AIDS and, and venereal diseases and all that. To the point where the 90s, by the mid 90s, you, you were, if you had sex with somebody you didn't know for a while, you're putting a gun to your head. You, you could be. And, and I'd say that that has changed now. Um, we're back to where internet dating, etc. you know. Well, look, whenever we read a magazine, we're not in a vacuum. And the people writing it, and the people drawing it, they didn't grow up on Mars. Although I would love to grow up on Mars. They didn't grow up on the moon. They grew up in this culture, in this world, and they're aware of these things. And so their, their story is going to be a modern commentary on these old ideas. Um, and so Jack is having a completely platonic relationship with Sarah and he's trying to save her. In fact, she is the classic um, fading waif. You know, she's, she can't, she can barely talk. She doesn't talk. She can barely breathe. Um, she's the perfect, I'm sorry, I don't mean this in a social justice way, but she's the perfect victim. Her mother's been killed. There's no one else there. She's going to die in an hour if he doesn't save her. So he picks her up and he walks her back to the last human outpost. And um, there's nothing sexual about this and which would be different in the 80s. If it was written in the 80s, there would be. But now we are so aware of um, abuse and pedophilia and not to mention men are monsters, right? Women are wonderful, men are monsters, that you cannot write a character that suggests any kind of um, physical interest in the innocent youth. And, and nor should you, right? But I'm just saying that that is a choice, and it is a choice that has to be made uh, in only one way. It's, it's a non-choice. Um, he finds a car. He fixes it. He cannibalizes other vehicles to make one vehicle work, and that's important because as he drives the vehicle away, and by the way, he, re he refers to the vehicle in a feminine form. He looks at her as something to be taken care of and to be worked on and to be, you know, interacted with in a, in a real way. Um, he, he puts on the front, this is Jack. You see that right away in a big sign. This is Jack. And you think that's arrogance, but we find out later it's wisdom. Um, very quickly, he runs into two bikers, reminiscent again of Mad Max world, and their conversation is all about eating the people inside. So we see that humans are cannibalizing humans. Those are loonies, right? Loonies are cannibalizing the non-loonies, or each other, really. I presume the loonies are 95% of the human population. Um, and then Jack deals with them in the way that probably you should. Um, then he drives up to the compound. Oh, so, so the point is, cannibalism is a functional way to deal with a reducing resource environment. If you have less and less food, eventually people will eat each other. If you have, like rats, right? If you have less and less uh, car manufacturing plants at right down to zero, then you're gonna have to cannibalize the existing technology 
to make a very smaller percent of the popular of technology work. So maybe you have five percent of the, the vehicles that work now in the world, and the other ninety-five percent are simply uh, providing parts. Um, he comes up to the last human compound, and with binoculars, they read it's Jack. So he knew what he was doing, and he knew where he was going, and he, he's advised. They advise the guards to let him in. Now this is interesting because he has committed crimes that this last human compound must respect. And I suspect those laws were created by the gore. I don't really know. It, it, he doesn't need us to know, I don't believe at this point in the story. But there's a set of laws that still rules this chaotic environment, possibly even near almost complete anarchy, and yet there are still laws and people still follow them. The chief of this town, the mayor, if you will, is a very strong woman. Um, in fact, her name is Kitten, or Kitty. Now, I believe I saw in a cantina scene elsewhere when they were carrying out a body, I believe that there's a man, like a sheriff figure, and a woman dragging out this body that had its head blown off while they sweep up all the remains. And I believe she was referred to as Kitten. That's, you can look for that yourself. That's kind of an Easter egg right? So Kitten is told, I have this girl, she's not going to make it if you don't take her in. And she asks a very important set of questions. Kitty asks three important questions. So you're seeing three, right? Jack has three, three things he remembers that are good rules to live by. Kitty's asking three questions. You know, this is the trilogy, right? Is she bit? Does she have any implants and is there anything shady about her? Well, we understand the first two. Is she bitten by a zombie? Implants would mean, you know, going cyborg would be considered a uh, sellout to the dark side or to some alien entity side or maybe just to the machine side because we see there are autonomous machines roaming around that are intelligent. But also anything shady about her, meaning demonic. So... Again, when Jesus accepted Peter back, Peter said, I betrayed you. And then Jesus said, I forgive you. I forgive you, I forgive you, right? Um, but actually in the ancient Hebrew, it wasn't the same phrase. It was um, philil, erotus, adonai. I love you, I love you, I love you. But it was, I love you like a brother. I love you like a lover. I love you like a god would love a god, or namaste. Um, so, likewise, we have this three, three point checklist here. Is she a zombie? Is she a cyborg? Is she demonic? Um, very interesting, I like that. And I'm, most Latin people have a strong Catholic or at least Christian background, and I suspect that's where this writing is coming from. Um, he then takes her into the medicine man, and I think you get the idea that I love this story. Its, it's art is wonderful. Um, I like other kinds of art, but I really like this art. The coloring is amazing. The shading is amazing. It's not perfect, but so what? We're, it's, it's 9 out of 10, okay? So this has been PM Trask for the White Lily Pocket Jacks channel. Uh, if you're here still, congratulations, because this was a long video. Okay, talk to you later.